Well, welcome everyone to the Monterey Bay Aquarium here live on Periscope, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube, YouTube. sending data. I don't think we're there yet. We're online on YouTube. Hey, everybody. Thanks go. so much for joining us. Uh, let's see. Let's get us back over into a place where we know what we're doing. Hey, thanks so much, everyone, for showing up. Uh, my name's Patrick. I work at the Aquarium here in social media alongside... Emily. I also work in our social media department. And we are just wrapping up the week right now, hanging out here in the aquarium. We're looking off of our back deck and watching some wild sea otters here in the Monterey Bay that are wrapped up in kelp themselves. Right. Talk about wrapping things up. That's what sea otters do here. If you are a sea otter hanging out there in the ocean and you take a nap, you want to wake up next to where you went to sleep. So uh, you don't want to just wake up halfway to the harbor. Uh, same as you folks out there. If you're going to bed, you want to kind of wake up near your bed. And sometimes you might find yourself on the target down the street, right on the target down the street. Yes. Or maybe you find yourself in front of the yeah. fridge one more time, like going after the, the leftover cake. You know, who knows what's happening in your world? One thing that you could try to do if that is happening to you a lot is wrap yourself up in kelp. That acts as your anchor, and that's what yeah. the sea otters are doing that you can see right there. It's and very cozy. It's it's better than, like, the weighted blankets, I think. It know? is. Yeah, yeah, it's a wetted blanket instead oh. of a weighted blanket. All right. Okay, we're doing this stuff live. <laughs> I, what I want to do <laughs> is I do want to transition us out of the frame. And there we go. We got the sea otters there in the evening light, and let's start going to the chat. Hey, Doodle3696. Otters are so cute over there on Twitch. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, we've got folks from all around the world here. Let's see. We yeah, got some close, some far away. We've got Marina. That's just up the street from us here. And Marysville, Roseville, Oak Park, Illinois tuning in right now. California. I saw Italy a moment ago as well. Oh, my goodness. I Look know, at all, all these over. folks. Hello from PA. Thanks for being there. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Bermuda. All Bermuda. Ooh. Oh, OK. Uh, if you start seeing geometric shapes on, on screen, everyone, you know where that's coming from. It's a Bermuda Triangle oh, joke. I'm trying. I'm sorry. Hey, welcome, everyone. <laughs> that was a stretch for the uh, end of the week there. <laughs> everything I try is a stretch, just like a sea otter <laughs> lounging in the kelp forest exactly. and resetting itself. Hey, Sam Shazalian. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, let's see. People from snowy Colorado tuning in. Las Vegas, Kansas. Oh, this is fantastic. Hello from Turlock. My family in is South from Turlock. So this is South Africa. Over there is on there. Twitch. Yeah. Now that's something. South Africa, you folks out there have giant kelp forests as well, but with mm -hmm. no sea otters in them, uh, which is really, really interesting because the kelp that we have here in California is different from the giant kelp that you folks have out there uh, in that our giant kelp didn't develop as much of a chemical resistance to grazing to see uh, to sea urchins and other things as uh, other places like in Australia and South Africa, other other zones where they have to compete directly with their with their predators. So anyway, you're looking at a similar thing, but we've got sea otters over here, which means that our kelp is a little bit different. So very cool. Let's see who else do we have in here. Belgium turning in Canada. Oh, we got CSU Long Beach tuning in New Nova York, Scotia, Tennessee, DC. Ohio, Sydney. Oh, my goodness. Everybody's tuning in. Hello, Santa Rosa, California. Austin, Texas. Keeping it weird. Fresno. Goodness. Everybody's tuning in from all around the world. This is Ontario, so exciting. Ontario, Georgia, Melbourne, Australia. This is very wow. exciting. This is great it's a great stuff. way to end a week. With Absolutely. All, all of you folks all over the world. So let's see. I'm going to transition us just to the wide shot so you can see a little bit of what we're looking at. So uh, Emily... Uh, your expert camera work found us the sea otters that we can now see there on the screen. And up at the top is a yellow buoy that marks the intake pipe for the Monterey Bay Aquarium that we were talking about a little bit earlier. Can you tell us, uh, Emily, maybe a little bit about this kelp forest that we have off the back deck? Because it, it changes throughout the year. Uh, there's lots of dynamic stuff. We usually see sea otters not all the time. Tell us a little bit about uh, that kelp forest off Definitely. the back deck. Definitely. So uh, kelp happens to be like many plants here on land where you have some that kind of bloom annually that happens with kelp as well it's a very annual algae out there in the bay and so for it right now it's actually a little bit thinner than it would normally be during the summertime when we have all of these wonderful nutrients coming up in this really cold rich water here in the monterey bay and so summertime lots and lots of kelp here in monterey bay wintertime we get the big waves rolling in and kind of ripping that kelp off of its hold fast off the rocks that it's been holding and on and attached to throughout the summer and fall and so uh, that's 
a very important role that the kelp forest actually plays here in the Monterey Bay because it has these annual cycles of booms and busts here in the bay. Even in wintertime when that kelp is being ripped up and then it sinks down to the bottom of the seafloor, it's bringing those nutrients down there with it. Right, Patrick? Yeah, absolutely. That, uh, that kelp uh, is so crucial for so many different uh, animals in the, in the environment. Uh, not only the, as you were mentioning, just, you know, the, the kelp itself, when it's here, uh, it looks, okay, it's a forest, you know, but uh, the thing about the ocean is ca- imagine if you had the forest on land and then during the winter, almost all the trees just blew away and <laughs> half the trees wound up somewhere in the sky and then other animals were hanging out like birds were just hanging out on these rafts of trees in the sky. Then the other half maybe went into canyons and kind of fed other animals there and then the other half just got piled up in the middle of Main Street, uh, wherever you happen to be. That's what happens in the kelp forest is the kelp grows, then gets ripped out. Some of it goes out to sea, some of it sinks down to the deep, some of it washes up on the beach. It's actually one of the first bits of research that the Monterey Bay Aquarium did when we opened in 1984, the first little bit of science that we did was putting tags on kelp to see where it is that those kelp plants went. And we, s- we discovered that there's this interconnectivity of the kelp that this otter might be wrapped up in where this kelp might wind up in its life is maybe in the deep sea feeding sea urchins, maybe out in the open ocean being a nursery for uh, young tuna and mola mola's ocean sunfish, or maybe washed up on the beach becoming a, uh, a Denny's in the desert for a migrating <laughs> shorebird just filled with kelp flies and larva and things of that yeah, nature. Yeah, that beach rack up there yeah. on the beach is I really important habitat. I, d- I did want to point out over on Twitch a uh, little bit of, uh, of an issue with uh, the CAPS ban. We've got a <laughs> oh no! <laughs> we've got a we've got a bot running over <laughs> on Twitch. Just uh, that that we we should adjust some of the settings there. So sorry about that, minor uh, Mina. We certainly appreciate your enthusiasm. In fact, uh, we love that you are showing your appreciation to us there over on Twitch. So uh, do not be deterred. We'll fix those settings there. Um, Emily, we've got quite a few questions over on YouTube yes. that are fantastic. Uh, and let me just transition us back here on screen so that we can oh, hold on we can answer your questions in person everyone here we go okay emily yes youtube questions here we go all right got the first one from alexander blind right up here how long have we worked at the monterey bay aquarium Ooh. Uh, for us it, it's actually very similar i've been here for about seven years now patrick a little bit longer than yeah, that i've been here about eight and a half years but when i was five years old i saw the sea otters at the aquarium want to be a marine biologist and come and work here and I've been a volunteer at the aquarium for 10 years, and you heard about the aquarium a long time ago as well, right? Uh, yeah, I actually came here when I was uh, in college volunteering with our Marine Awareness and Conservation Society. I'm from Arizona originally, where we do not have mm. any uh, oceans, so the Marine former Awareness oceans. Lots of former was, oceans, yeah, former yeah. oceans yeah, yeah, yeah. there, but having a Marine Awareness Club, very important, so uh, we could share with people that, hey, there are indeed oceans out there, but we came here um, on a volunteer field trip and just absolutely fell in love with the place and managed to find my way back out here after I graduated college after a few years. Oh, that's awesome. Let's see. We got Facebook question. Is cold water richer because it holds oxygen better? That is part of it for at least uh, certain animals. They prefer the more oxygenated waters. The other thing is that colder water tends to mean water that has been mixed up and in the ocean when you have nutrients, uh, so anything that's living, it dies, often it sinks, and uh, so the nutrition kind of goes away from the surface where the sunlight is. And so in colder water, you tend to have more mixing, uh, and so because of that, you tend to have, um, or at least in our area, our cold water is from the upwelling, and so that tends to bring nutrition up to the surface. And so uh, cold water tends to have huge amounts of biomass um, and kind of spread out uh, in terms of the water column, the kelp forest. In a coral reef environment, you don't have quite as much activity in the plankton and the water column uh, in terms of primary production, so like plants, et cetera. So yeah, cold water, uh, definitely not barren. In fact, completely chock full of life. Uh, very different yeah. from uh, from other places you may go diving where there's nothing between the surface and the bottom. Crystal clear water, but not a whole lot of life growing. Yeah, mm. exactly. So just in terms of biodiversity, these cold water habitats are just chock full of life out there from animals and algaes, 
all different kinds of things living out there in the ocean that are just basking in the in the chilly waters, these chilly yeah. nutrient rich, rich waters. Let's see. We had a question uh, from Gabrielle Lagusis. What is the otter scientific name? Emily, can you name the three sea otter scientific names? I'm going to give it have. my best Ooh. try. Let's so go. <laughs> Let's give it a shot. We so got there it. There is only one sea otter species. I do want to point that out. One sea otter species, they are all in Hydra lutris. That is going to be genus species yes. name right there. Uh, but we do have three subspecies right of below. sea otters. So the ones that we are looking at on screen right over there right now and right below us <laughs> there, uh, <laughs> those are going to be in Hydra lutris nereus, the southern sea otters. And then uh, just north of us, we have sea otters that live up by the British Columbia coast. I saw people tuning in from British Columbia, Canada. You got those beautiful northern sea otters up there. And then just across on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, uh, over by uh, I think like Russia and mm -hmm. Japan, the that Islands, and yep. area, mm -hmm. uh, that's where you are going to get another subspecies of sea otters. And those are going to be in Hydra lutris lutris, easy one to remember, mm -hmm. and then in Hydra lutris kionii. I'm going to butcher that pronunciation. Kenyoni. 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 So, yeah. Kenyoni. I can spell it. Yeah. I can't pronounce it. Yeah. <laughs> so, th but those are the three <laughs> subspecies, and it's important to note, Emily, like you were saying, it's one species used to go from uh, basically the Korean Peninsula uh, and northern Japan all the way to Mexico, all the way down to um, to Baja uh, in those kelp forests. So, sea otters used to go that entire range, and virtually eliminated by the fur trade that happened in the 17 and 1800s. And interestingly, I just found this out, that the sea otter fur trade is really what helped encourage um, colonialism basically on the west coast of, of America because the Russian fur traders were following the fur down. And so it kind of helped accelerate them down. They weren't setting up you know, homesteads along the way trying to build cities. It was like follow the sea otters and that's what ended up getting uh, European influence into California a lot mm. faster than it would have in other places. So following that uh, that soft gold, as it was known, of the sea otter pelts bringing them down that coastline. Yeah, over there on YouTube, we got Lena asking yes. if sea otters migrate or oh, is the temperature fantastic. here in the bay always okay for them? Yeah. And they don't. They they stay right here. This is their home base. They stay in these waters. They are kind of homebodies. They tend to stay in one area, and that is where they're going to go. They're going to travel a little bit as the weather changes. So especially as big storms roll into the bay, they'll find kind of more protected areas, especially up by Elkhorn Slough. That's a really a popular area where a lot of sea otters in the bay go to when there are storms in the area, kind of around mm -hmm. the corner from here, some of the more protective inlets and coves and such, but they are yeah. in one area. We have a question from Ed Arias 87. Patrick, can you name the original A-Team? I cannot, however, uh, we do have a question here about what it exactly it is that these animals eat, and I can say that it's a lot. <laughs> I hope that worked. That's the A-team that these sea otters are, are munching on. There uh, are A-team. Yeah, sea otters <laughs> eat over 100 <laughs> species of marine invertebrates. So those are animals without backbones. That's uh, squid, mussels, clam, abalone, uh, every otter, crabs. The every otter is kind of trained by their mom on specific skill sets, recipes, if you will, of what to go and grab out there in the kelp forest. So a sea otter that focuses on abalone, it's going to be different from a sea otter that focuses on smaller, fair little snails and stuff. Um, and that's actually why uh, you see uh, a lot of otters hanging out, eating other things instead of the urchins that some of you folks were pointing out that are up and down the coast here. Um, as you can see, there's kelp growing here off, uh, off of Cannery Road. Down below there are sea urchins, but a lot of the otters haven't started eating those yet because they've got other things that they're eating on. So it takes a little, there's a lag time between uh, when the otters are, are doing what they classically do. But uh, Emily, as you know, as a scientist, you know, we hear all these stories about how kelp, urchins, how it all works together. It's very, very simple. And uh, as we were just mentioning, it's a very dynamic it's a and very complex, complex system. system. So yeah. complex and dynamic interactions all the time. There. Yeah, and one yeah. thing that I want to point out, I know that we were talking about it on Twitch earlier with some folks, but you just mentioned mother sea otters teaching their pups how to eat and how to forage. And just... 
over there if you're if you're looking at the screen that way on yeah, screen there beyond Patrick um, that Sierra that we're focusing on right now is actually a mother with a pup on her tummy right now so if you see that extra little fuzz ball hang out there on her tummy uh, that is her pup that she has been holding on to and grooming and uh, taking a little snooze with right now so keep an eye out for any action happening over there during our, our live stream right now Absolutely. Let's see. Let's go through the chat. There are a few folks on Twitch. Oh, Miner Mina was asking, what's our favorite branch of marine biology or our favorite species? And uh, obviously I have to go. Sea otters are just a fundamental species for me as far as uh, I saw the sea otters here. I want to be a marine biologist and work here. My favorite species today, though, is the ocean sunfish, the mola mola. You can see them swimming around in our open sea exhibit every once in a while. They're my favorite fish. We saw a bunch out here in the Monterey Bay a little bit earlier from a boat. Uh, there's so many molas uh, here in the bay, so that's going to be my favorite. Emily, what's yours? All right, favorite branch of marine biology. Oh, there you go. I'm yeah. going to go a little she's differently actually, She's actually going directly yeah, to, the go the question. to the question. Yeah, you focused on the animals. I said what I felt like Focus saying. on the animals. Yeah, that's no, you okay. You're tell, it's no, because you're people. a marine biologist sure. at heart. I'm an ecologist at heart. So I studied ecology and evolutionary biology uh, when I went to the University of Arizona. And so in my heart, my favorite kind of branch is marine ecology, learning about how animals interact with each other interact with their environment i love seeing all those kind of dynamic relationships between different things out there in the ocean but as far as favorite species goes it changes every single day both for patrick <laughs> and, and myself here uh i think that my favorite and it's been my favorite that i've been mentioning a lot lately and it's because i want more people to be aware of this fish yes. and how adorable it is here, let's let's bring it sorry i i'm uh, let's bring us back here for the, okay. for the reveal. Yes. This is the very important thing that you should all know about. They are called grunt sculpins. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> grunt yep. sculpins. Uh, they are very tiny. They're about this big. Yay big. And everything about them <laughs> is meant to mimic looking like a barnacle. Yep. And so they'll live inside of old barnacle shells. They have fins that look like the feeding tentacles of barnacles, little fuzzy feet of barnacles that they use to, to eat. But for these grunt sculpins, there's just their fins. They just happen to look a lot like a barnacle. And it's the most adorable fish in the <laughs> ocean out there. So grunt sculpins, Everybody should know about them. They are amazing. They're a cold water fish, so we see them uh, here along the California coastline. Uh, but they are absolutely my favorite fish out there. I know that there's arguments about what the cutest fish in the ocean is. This is 100% what I think the cutest fish out there is. I don't know, Patrick, do you have a favorite or y cutest fish oh. in your mind? I mean, you completely, yeah. I mean, you that's the ground sculpin looking like a barnacle. I, I mean, just, just look them up. I, I'm going to see if we can maybe see if we have a photo of them here from the aquarium. Uh, ground sculpins are, are amazing. Do I think that there's a cutest fish? Uh, I mean, I love molas, uh, sunfish. I think that they have their, their own unique charm. Um, but I think maybe uh, my... Oh, sorry. There's a harbor seal that just popped up here <laughs> just out the window. That's what I was looking at. Sorry, buddy. Um, <laughs> let's see. I, I know what the one of the grumpiest looking fish or one of the strangest looking fish that, that I can think of right now. I'm going directly to like a very cute, but very bizarre looking fish called the plain fin midshipman. There are Those loads are of these good. in the Monterey Bay right now, everybody. Yeah. If you go, uh, if you're out diving at night or if, uh, or if you're in the tide pools, you might see this very weird animal that just is looking up uh, at the, at the sky, just eyes straight up. Big ol' underbite. Oh, oh, I'll go get the camera. All right, get the camera. Here, let's see. I'll transition us over to just me here for a quick second. The camera sometimes just decides that it's had enough of the adorable, cute hair off the back, so we're looking good. All right, thank you, Emily. Welcome back. And flawless. Flawless. <laughs> now we're back out live. Um, so, yeah, so the uh, plain fin midshipman, plain fin midshipman, excuse me, um, those fish have been out here in the Monterey Bay in huge, huge numbers. You might even see them in the tide pools. And here's the here's the thing about uh, the plain fin midshipmen is that they make their own sound. They drum on their swim bladder. I believe that's how they're making their sounds. And that drumming is so loud, it sounds like a boat motor is revving next to your head. And so if you're out there uh, scuba diving or at night and you hear just like this really strong, like a boat motor sound right next to your head, 
probably the mating call of a plain fin midshipman and they're out here in the monterey bay right now there's tons of little baby ones that are up off the sand and if you get close to them they just they just go right down into the sand so they come up and then you go up to them and they go and hide away so plain fin midshipmen are uh probably the most charismatic fish i can think of here at, at the moment there definitely the i like that you mentioned though that yes there it is doodle, doodle yes plain there. fin midshipmen sorry what was that Emily? oh no i was just saying that you mentioned that these mid these plain fin midshipmen that is a tough one to, to put together plain fin midshipmen, plain fin plain midshipmen. Fin midshipmen. <laughs> um, that they're making these noises out there in the ocean and a lot of times when we think about the ocean we often hear it called like the silent world out there when mm -hmm. in fact the ocean is just alive with all different noises all different sounds so much sound. we have the live hydrophone that is uh run by the monterey bay aquarium research institute that is in the bay running all the time 24 hours a day you can tune into it and Right now we're hearing humpback whales singing. The other night I was tuning in and there were a pod of dolphins that you could hear swimming by. You could hear the blue whales that have been in the bay lately too. And it's just absolutely phenomenal just how lively the, the, just the sound is out there in the ocean. And uh, uh, Emily, you probably are familiar uh, with um, the research that showed that many fish actually require sounds of healthy reefs to be able to find their way their their way home so if you uh, are out diving or snorkeling you might hear a lot of snapping and crunching from snapping shrimp and other organisms that are doing their thing out there uh and the the fish actually use that to find their way home right yeah, yeah. And so, you know, s audio cues are just as important for a lot of animals in the ocean or sometimes even more important than, say, visual cues are because sound travels so well in water. So that sound is, you know, really helping these sounds. Th sorry, the water is helping these sounds yeah. travel for, you know, miles and miles and miles. And these animals are using those as, as a cue to find their food, find their way home, find each other out there in the ocean which is a lot of times why you he hear those humpback whales singing it might just be a signal to each other that hey i'm here yeah. come and join me yeah it's uh it's amazing how much sound um is utilized by animals under the water uh you think about up in the air you know you can i mean right now we can see 20 miles basically you know from here to fremont peak basically uh underwater you can't see 20 miles uh so there are different ways that these crazy. animals <laughs> yeah there, <laughs> there are different ways that these animals uh that animals in the ocean just they have a different frame of reference as far as like what's what's important for uh getting input about your environment and sound is one of those those big things okay i want to bring up the chat uh if you're wondering yeah. i've been looking a little bit um I'm lo looking a little, a little bit, bit distracted yeah. over here on the stream, and that is because, let's see. Uh, see if we can pull. Yeah, let me see if I can pull in here some images of those grunt sculpins. We didn't know we were going to talk about the grunt no, we sculpins and the plain grunt fed midshipmen. Sorry, we should always be prepared for. No, grunt you sculpins. can never be prepared for grunt sculpins because <laughs> no matter what happens, whenever you see them, they are just. Uh, they they are just absolutely fantastic. So let's see. There's a little grunt sculpin. Let's Such see if we can pull that one up right there. <laughs> um, yeah. So ask us those questions there in the chat, everyone. By the way, if you're just joining us, welcome to the Monterey Bay Aquarium here, uh, leading into the weekend. Uh, my name's Patrick, and my name is Emily. We're the social media team here at the aquarium. We've got our manager Anne Marie, who's probably tuning in, making sure that uh, we're not going too crazy here. Too on this crazy, Friday but okay. Afternoon. So, so everyone, we we were talking about grunt sculpins. If you're still there watching, here is a grunt sculpin ready and ready for this. Go! Look, Look at, at that, that cute buddy. Absolutely adorable. Uh, so that uh. is a fish that is trying to look like a barnacle, which is a crab that pile drives its head into the ground and uses its legs to gather its food the rest of its life. So there is That's your grunt good. sculpin right there. And now what we're gonna uh, do is we're gonna pull up the plain fin much. midshipman <laughs> to give you a sense of the other charismatic fish that I was mentioning. Let us transition now. There it is. There's the plain fin midshipman <laughs> right there. So some those are <laughs> some of us. That's kind of how I'm feeling <laughs> yeah. after this week. That's that's. Uh, so anyway, I feel that fish. There. Those there are the two <laughs> fish that we we're mentioning. So for those of you who are watching, if you watch the replay and you hear us talking about ground sculpins, plain fin midshipmen, there they were. 
those are uh, two incredible fish that we have out here. Uh, sometimes in the Monterey Bay, I think Grunt Sculpins a little bit further north. Plainfin Midshipmen certainly have them out here in the Monterey Bay. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah. If you have any <laughs> requests of animals, by the way, now that we've figured out a little bit of a workflow there on the back end, uh, if you do have any requests for animals, uh, let us know. Anything you've seen at the aquarium, we'll do we can our bring best. those up as well. Yeah, Doodle3696 over there on Twitch. That is, that what ship a mood. is, <laughs> yeah, that, that plain fin midshipman is what a mood right there. Definitely. Um, I also saw a comment over on Periscope. They were asking yeah. if this is a good time of the year to go whale watching. It's actually Oof. great whale watching all year round, right, Patrick? Absolutely. It's it's fantastic whale watching here in the Monterey Bay all year round because we have resident humpback whales that are pretty much here the whole time. Uh, you also have orcas that migrate around. Um, those are usually more common in the April, May time if you want to see them there potentially hunting um, for the gray whales. However, uh, when it comes to whale watching right now is just uh, an amazing time to come because there are not only blue whales in the Monterey Bay that have been sighted off and on. We actually saw some blue whales right off the back deck kind of right off of this uh, where the sea otter is sleeping blue whales went by um no big so deal cool. yeah yeah so there were some blue whales off the back deck of the well, aquarium just can we just put ago. that in perspective yeah. very quickly yes. so where yeah. we are looking at right now at these sea otters the water is only about 60 feet deep yep the largest blue whale ever recorded was 111 feet mm -hmm. long. Mm -hmm. And so these are huge animals that are swimming in water that if they were to put their nose on the sea floor and stick their tail up in the air, the tail would go up. It'd be the other half. It'd be a four-story yeah, building be the other, up there. be the other half of the animal completely it's, out there. It's so cool that that's happening just where you're looking just right now. Right outside. Yeah. yeah. So those blue whales, they come here to the bay to feed. Um, and whale watchers have been seeing loads of blue whales. There have also been fin whales, humpbacks. Uh, within the same day, there's uh, the white shark babies hanging out over near Santa Cruz you may have heard about. So definitely it's never a bad time to go whale watching because probably, you know, depending on your relationship with whales or what, what you see that like the whales might be the least interesting thing that you see. If you go out there, you might end up seeing massive, you know, 2000 pound mola mola as ocean yeah. sunfish on the surface. People have been seeing blue sharks, mako sharks. Um, Today out there on the boat, you're yeah. seeing just these huge, uh, just swaths of, of jellies. Yeah, sea nettle too. swarm sea is nettles. strong. Out yeah. We got the spicy water out beyond uh, that yellow buoy uh, that we have up on the screen. Just to give you a little bit more context, those blue whales were swimming just beyond that yellow buoy there. Uh, and let's transition us back here a little bit closer. A little closer there. You it's can getting see a little dark a little here. Dark. Mm -hmm. I can see if I can brighten up the camera a little bit. Oh uh, yeah, if if you feel like it. I mean, this is this All is right. the evening light, or yeah, maybe uh, because we can't really see the otter too much. Uh, maybe we transition to a look down along Cannery Row or some other camera move. Completely up to you. What do now, you think? Well, now it's your choice of well, I'm changing the camera angle if yeah. you want to look at. Plain fin midshipman, grunt sculpin, or, sculpin. Or, or the back deck photo that, that yeah we, we, that we, we might we might pull up there. the back deck photo here but uh, but yeah here Emily if you're gonna do a camera move maybe let's take a look at uh, evening light over, over cannery, cannery row, row. What, yeah. What, yeah let's try that all right I'll be right back all right I'm gonna transition us get ready for this is gonna be jarring we're moving to the other side of the screen and whoosh okay thanks Emily. All right, let's go to the chat, everybody. Thanks so much uh, for being there, everyone. Let's see. Always a good time for whale watching. Yes. Ab okay, let's see. Bring up the flag rock fish. Okay, flag rock fish. We're going to do that. Oh, what are sea otter predators? Good question. Sea otters don't have uh, many predators, if at all, uh, when they are... Um, when they are adults, when they're younger, up in uh, up in different areas, people may have heard of uh, bears getting them on on the beach. Certainly, back in the day, uh, people would go after them. You know, bald eagles. There are re reports, ideas that that could happen, but there really aren't too many things that are eating sea otters because they really don't have that much food to them. Uh, they're basically meat and fur, not a whole lot of fat. So, for example, a white shark that might be out there trying to uh, go looking for some food. The otters that get bit by white sharks in, uh, in our area tends to be a case of mistaken identity where they think that maybe it's a seal or something floating on the surface. But once they bite into the otter, obviously not a good return on investment there. And so they tend to leave the otters with a bite, but they don't tend to consume them. So that's something to know. 
Uh, let's see here. Where can I? Yeah, let's pull up here the flag rock fish because we had a request for a flag rock fish. So we'll do that very quickly. Uh, flag rock fish are absolutely uh, gorgeous organisms. Let's see, where am I? I'm going to copy that and we'll come over here. Live production. No big deal, everybody. Okay. Here is our flag rock fish. Absolutely adorable. And I'll transition me out of the frame. There's our flag rock fish. Absolutely gorgeous. More of a deeper water rock fish. Uh, there are 75 plus rock fish species that we have here in the Monterey Bay. Um, and uh, they are incredibly abundant in the Northeast Pacific. You don't tend to see too many rock fishes much anywhere else in the world. Uh, you'll see a species here, a species there. Uh, but in the Northeast Pacific, you have um, 7,500 plus, uh, if you include the entire range of where you can find these, uh, these amazing fishes. Uh, incredibly speciose. Many of them uh, are almost impossible to tell apart from other um, from other different species of rockfish, uh, even though you know they look exactly identical to us, they're very different, obviously, to the rockfish. They have different species there. So that was the flag rockfish there. Looks like Emily is back, which means that we should have a gorgeous view here Hopefully. along Cannery Row. I believe a little bit of a window reflection there. But yeah, I believe what we'll have to do is just disconnect and then reconnect. reconnect. If you want to pull that one okay. there. Let's see, who else we got in the chat? Are we open Thanksgiving Day? Yes, we are open Thanksgiving Day. The only day that we are closed is December 25th. Stargazer is always a good choice, too. Oh, Joel, yes, we will get the Stargazer up. There's our live Ooh, cam. Looks a little that's bit different then. Well, uh, that's the 4K zoom. Oh, that's why. There we go. <laughs> that, now, would, uh, that would do it. And then get ready, everybody. We are going to go from this side of the screen to that side of the screen. Get ready, one, two, three, and whoosh. There we go. Nice. Ooh, what birds are in the water? Emily, tell us oh. about the birds. <laughs> what are the birds? My favorite thing to talk about. You guys know the way to my heart here. So <laughs> a lot of the birds that you were seeing when we uh, were focused on the sea otters just a moment ago were just our local cormorants. So we have pelagic cormorants here as well as brant's cormorants. And we also have uh, two kind of most common species of gulls that we're seeing right now are going to be our western gulls as well as our hermans gulls, uh, which are really exciting. We actually have a big colony of hermans that decided to... Uh, uh, take up residence over there if you visit the area or if you're local and you know uh, Lover's Point uh, there is a whole bunch <laughs> there are yeah. a whole bunch of Hearman's Gulls over there right now for the first time that I've ever seen which is it's really exciting but as far as other species of birds we have so many different species of birds here we are along the Pacific Flyway and so this time of year when birds are on their fall migrations we see birds from all over the world coming through the Monterey Bay, including mm -hmm. birds that are going from one pole to the other. So we have red knots. Um, they're one of my favorite birds where um, they'll start up by the Arctic Circle and then go down towards the Antarctic Circle and then just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth every single year. And they're just absolutely amazing shorebirds there. We have Willets, we have stilts, we have avocets, we have godwits, we have all different kinds of incredible shorebirds, the plovers here. It's um, getting to be that time of year where you might see signs on beaches just saying to stay out of certain areas because of different bird nesting sites that they might be starting to establish there. So just keep that in mind if you're visiting any beaches, either this weekend yeah. or uh, any time that you're on vacation, maybe for the holidays. Um, just keep an eye out for some of those signs there. They're there for a reason uh, mm -hmm. to protect those birds who uh, are sharing our wonderful public beaches with all of us too. Um, oh, I just saw some Sorry, I got very excited. Yep. I saw someone. Greetings from Arizona. Hello. Nice. Yeah, Tila nice. Trouble. I there. am from Arizona, fellow Arizonan right here. So welcome. There welcome to uh, Monterey Bay. Yeah, we have a, a question. Any double crested cormorants that you ever seen out here? I've never seen one in the Monterey Bay, but have you? You haven't? I haven't seen a double crested I've myself. 
I, think I may have without thinking have about and it. Just didn't know. Yeah, about yeah, yeah, it. yeah. We definitely do see double crested okay. cormorants. They are definitely more common in other places. Yeah. Um. So here we might see a couple of double crested cormorants. I've definitely seen them from the back deck of the mm-hmm. aquarium here, but for the most part, it's just our pelagic cormorants and our brant's cormorants. Yeah. The pelagic cormorants are pretty cool because they actually nest underneath the under aquarium. the deck. And actually, from yeah. uh, from here on the cam, if you take a look this way. Uh, you can see where that wave is breaking there on the side of the aquarium. Uh, just underneath, around the corner from there, you're going to have uh, lots of nests for pigeon guillemots, uh, for those cormorants that you were mentioning, uh, all throughout the summer. So if you are here uh, in the summer, you'll see a lot of that nesting activity right there. Uh, is the ocean at high tide right now? So yeah, it's close to high tide. Pretty high tide. Pretty high tide, yeah, yeah just looking at it. You can still see some of those rocks out there, which means yeah. that it's not quite high, well, high yeah, tide. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can check the. But yeah, you are looking. If, if if you didn't see any of those rocks, you know it's high tide. And then if you see kind of almost uh, like a tide pooly beach area, that's like a very low tide, like where we are right there. So, um, yeah, it's a good question there. Let's see. Are there albatross on the base still? Absolutely. So yeah. we mostly see black-footed albatross here. Mm-hmm. Um, the occasional lace-on albatross will come through the bay as well. But they those are two are basically yeah. exactly the same, except one uh, flew through a small. chimney and is covered in soot, basically, oh. right? Uh, lace-on albatrosses yeah. are going to be a, a lot smaller. Than they the are going to yeah. albatross. They but can yeah, interbreed though. They're both. They can. Yeah. Um, but they are both pelagic that. seabirds, and so if you want to see them and you're visiting the Monterey Bay, the best time of the year to see them is going to be during the springtime, and if what you're going to want to do is hop on a boat and get out there and uh, be out in the open water. They tend to follow a lot of the orcas that we see in the bay around um, because they are scavengers, uh, particularly those black-footed albatrosses. They're following orcas and basically picking up any scraps that Which they might find. That, that is one of the coolest facts about any bird is uh, a black-footed albatross smelling its way to uh an orca kill to get a meal like that's pretty it's pretty (laughs) yeah that's pretty rad (laughs) and these are birds so like the lace on albatross that we see here they're coming here they're feasting on things like the squid that are in the monterey bay uh but they're coming from nesting islands all the way out off the coast of hawaii over in the Midway Islands out there. And so you have them nesting on these tiny islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and then flying thousands and thousands of miles to come out here to Monterey to just gorge and feast on fish and squid and then head back out to those same islands to nest again. So these are animals that spend the majority of their life far, far away from shore out there in this vast open ocean where it's very tough to find food, so they come towards the coast to do just that, and just just happens to be one of those areas that just has so much life in it that it's a great stop for pelagic seabirds, but it's also a great stop for a lot of those uh, shorebirds and other migrating birds here along the Pacific Flyway. So speaking of those birds, Emily, I'm going to transition us over so that we can actually see those birds that you were so expertly yeah. describing to us here now for everyone is a... Laysan albatross. There, there she is. She There's Makana. Makana meaning our gift in Hawaiian. Girl. She is our sweet uh, albatross lady who's been here at the aquarium for a while now. She damaged her left wing when she was younger, so she's not able to fly. That's why she's here mm-hmm. at the aquarium. And oh, we've got quite a few folks tuning in here over on on Twitch. Twitch. Hey Yay. everyone. Hey Slitherpunk. Hey there. Ooh, how often do we see? Orca pods is another question. Do we get puffins? Yeah, here, why don't you take some of those questions there, and I'm going to pull up a photo of a black-footed albatross here real quick so that we can see what that looks like. All right, Patrick's working on bird photos. He's on bird photo duty. I'll take care of some of those questions. So do we get puffins? We do, although it's incredibly, incredibly cool to be able to see them from shore. They're another one of those birds that when we do see them, we're more likely to see them from a boat. In particular, we see tufted puffins here, most common 
Um, you want to head a little bit further north if you're looking for horned puffins. So we have tufted puffins and horned puffins here along the west coast of North America. If you head over to the east coast of North America, that's where you're going to see those Atlantic puffins. They're kind of the classic puffin that most people think of when they think of puffins are those Atlantic puffins. But I'm particularly fond of horned puffins. They're my favorite puffins. Yeah, I'll pull those up here next. But here is, for everyone's enjoyment, a black black-footed albatross. albatross. Look Coming at in that. for a land in there. And this was actually from a few years ago where we were out on the bay following orcas, and here came these black-footed albatrosses uh, right on cue there. So uh, if you were wondering if uh, orca pods have other members than just orcas, well, you've got the air force coming <laughs> in there behind them of the black-footed <laughs> albatross uh, following them around. Okay, so I will transition us away from that. Uh, Horn puffins, we've got the closing announcement you might hear Ooh, in the background. In the background it there. is 4.45. It is quarter to five, everybody. It is almost done or wrapped almost up here there. for the week. Almost made it to, to five o'clock on Friday. Almost <laughs> there. So if you have any questions, otherwise I'm going to transition Oh, over. that's very kind, Michelle. Thank you. Well, Michelle well, over there on Facebook said that well, she Michelle could listen to us all day. Oh, well, we can barely do that. So I appreciate <laughs> that someone does. That's <laughs> awesome. Um, to answer stuff. the question from before that you brought up, Patrick, yes. of do we see orca pods in the bay? We do. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we can see orcas here all year round. However, in the springtime, we see them more frequently. Um, in particular, we see pods of orcas that will come in hunting gray whales. So where we happen to be located is where a lot of the gray whales will kind of come into the bay on their way down the coast and back up the coast on their migrations. So they're going up and feeding off the coast of Alaska and Russia, kind of up there in that region, going down, gorging and gorging and gorging on little benthic invertebrates up there. So they're scooping up big mouthfuls of mud and seawater and then using their baleen to filter out all of that stuff and getting all the good things that were hidden inside of the mud. And then they're getting nice and big, nice and strong, and then making their way back down the coast to Mexico to the lagoons down there. That's where they're giving birth and that's where they're mating. And so when they're coming back north from Mexico to Alaska along that journey, especially the mothers with their calves, uh, they're trying to protect them. So they kind of hug the coastline and hug the kelp forest for protection. The orcas are coming in and they're trying to hunt those calves because it's a lot easier to catch a gray whale calf than it is to catch a full-blown adult gray whale. Absolutely. And don't think too much about the fact that maybe they just enjoy whale veal. Oh, no. Don't hey, think too much. This is Don't think too much about that. That's what I said. It's Friday. If you're, think if you're thinking about it's it too much, Friday, I told you not to. Patrick. I told you not to. Don't take this out they on me. Didn't I told come here for the circle. I told them not to. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're back on bird photo we duty. We're back on bird here's photos. A, here's a puffin. Here's that tufted puffin. It's very good. Oh, look at it. So it's got the blonde feather eyebrows and then the white face mask and then a beak sheath, uh, which is this here. I that actually. keratin sheath that it has yeah. on its beak. We right have there. the technology to, to zoom. To zoom Enhance, in. Enhance, Patrick. Let's zoom in on that face. There it is. So you can see there, it's got that beak sheath there at the base of the beak. The white um, face, blonde feather eyebrows. That's what they use to impress their mates. Both the males and the females get that there. Okay. Oh, Doodle over on Twitch. We're so glad you caught this stream too. We're going to try and be live on Twitch uh, kind of on a schedule every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. So... Uh, once we get into That's the swing the of things, we kind of did that soft launch of our Twitch channel there. So we're really excited to have have followers and to have friends over there on Twitch. No, Thanks so yay. much for, for tuna in. Thanks tuna for ing tuna in. in. There oh, we go. Way to fit that one in there, Emily. That's professional. <laughs> we have a bit of, well, not really a competition. We just have a, a state of being where we try to come up with various puns yeah. with each other throughout the week. Our, our best way of describing it, you called it once long ago, is that uh, word association syndrome. Yeah, debilitating yeah. word association <laughs> syndrome. <laughs> yeah. Association. I'm sorry. Association. Yeah, association. Association. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, um, we're a lot of fun at parties, everyone. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this one I want to point out is courtesy of Photo Arc and Joel Sartori. You should be able to see that. A uh, uh, fantastic gentleman came here to the aquarium to take these photos. So this is courtesy of Joel Sartori, and you will be able to see now a horned puffin. Et voila. 
Now, the big difference here. It's magnifique. Yes, white belly. That's the mm -hmm. key difference between a uh, horn puffin and a tufted puffin, if you're looking at them. White belly, horn puffin. They also have the Cleopatra mask, the beautiful horn, uh, keratin there above their eye. Um, and I can tell you, Emily, from seeing these birds fly in Alaska, they are uh, often referred to as the flying potato as they fly around. They are absolutely ridiculous. There's oh that yeah. face again. Look at it. I mean, these are birds that are built to both fly and dive. So when you're looking at a lot of birds that are diving out there in the ocean, they do kind of look like potatoes because their legs are so far back on their bodies. Versus if you look at a bird up here on land, if you go outside and you're, you know, watching your bird feeder and you're seeing different hummingbirds and sparrows and finches and everything fly by, you'll notice th and standing there on your bird feeder that their feet are kind of, their legs are in the middle of their body yeah. uh, versus these puffins and a lot of those diving birds out there that have their legs kind of tucked back towards the back of their body, which makes them look really kind of top heavy. It <laughs> looks like they're about to fall there. over. <laughs> makes them look very round, uh, just like a little potato there. But it's perfect because that's a way where they can when they're diving, kind of tuck those legs in, and make themselves really streamlined so that they don't waste the energy as they're kind of flying underwater. Um, instead, if you, you know, try to have another bird swim, it'd be much more difficult for them. Exactly. Yeah. Just being what makes you a good bird makes you a bad fish and the other way around. So yes. just it's so difficult to think about the life of a shorebird, of a seabird, uh, just to try to make a living between land and water when you have such completely different requirements to be good at one and the other. So yeah. kudos to puffins is what we're trying to say. <laughs> exactly. Great job out there. I do want to say thank you to everyone who is sending in questions right yes. now. We are live in case you're just tuning in across four different platforms currently. Yeah. So Twitch, Periscope, Facebook, and YouTube and looking oh at goodness, the questions from all of those different platforms. So if we don't get to your question, we apologize. We're just trying to answer questions from everywhere right now, but we we value all of you and we thank all of you for tuning in and yeah. uh, hanging out this evening with yeah, us. Yeah, and it, if you were tuning in to see the sea otters, it got a little bit too dark to see the sea otters. So uh, um, scroll away, go look at something more relevant to your interest if it's sea otters you're looking for, and then go back to the uh, beginning here of the broadcast. You should see a mother sea otter pup. But right now, we're looking at the fading sun over uh, Cannery Row here. The sun sets on the opposite side of the peninsula behind the aquarium. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're slowly seeing there things get a little bit darker. We've got our staff there on the back deck doing a last bit of interpretation with some of our visitors there. Um, just looking at this historic, storied, absolutely beautiful uh, place that we get to call home here at the aquarium. And the thing that I love about this shot, Emily, that you have set up is that the the aquarium just falls into the ocean and the ocean is coming and licking right at the doors of the aquarium. It really, uh, it's really cool to be here in this place where you get to see inside and outside land, water, a cannery row, uh, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. It's all right there. Yeah. It's yeah. really, we're so fortunate to be in this unique space right here on this National Marine Sanctuary one, but just to be on this beautiful, healthy bay itself. We got this awesome question here from Keith Johnson over on Facebook there. Puffins are endangered, uh, question mark. That was Sartori's theme for that photo project, as I recall. Uh, puffins are endangered they in many, in many areas. They are threatened animal yeah. in many areas on the endangered species list. But I do know that what uh, Mr. Sartori was doing was going around and trying to chronicle all the species, every single species that is in a living collection in a zoo, aquarium, uh, science center, trying to chronicle every single species that there might be out there um, as the uh, zoo archive uh, project there. So it was every single species that he yeah. could, he took a photo of here at the aquarium. Yeah, definitely. But um, in case you're wondering about puffins specifically, they are threatened, um, especially when it comes to things like uh, plastic pollution out there in the ocean. So a great way just to make sure that you're helping out seabirds and all birds, all animals out there in the ocean is just thinking about the single use plastics in our lives and uh, really uh, talking to your senators, your congressmen, women uh, and uh trying to move towards a, a more sustainable future. We are all about sustainability. Yeah, and you were you were mentioning, you know, how difficult it is as a seabird and just uh, everything is connected, obviously, right? You can see there's there's no, you know, clean transition from 
what is Cannery Row and the Monterey Bay Aquarium and people and our our town and the kelp forest right out there, right? It would be a mistake to look at the kelp forest off the back deck and say this is completely unimpacted by humans. You can see yeah. that we butt right up next right to it. You there. can see it right here on the on on the screen. And so uh, every little bit that you've heard about as far as like lowering emissions for climate change, sustainable seafood, uh, reducing single-use plastic waste, every single one of those things is going to help a seabird. It's going to help a fish. It's going to help uh, a marine mammal because everything is connected. And so much of that is systemic and structural uh, to how we live our life. And so that's why uh, voting, uh, being involved in your local community with legislation, your city council, uh, all the way on up to uh, Washington, federal representation. You know, we have a federal marine sanctuary right out here, but we have our local community of Cannery Row right here in Monterey Bay. Uh, it's big, it's small, it's, uh, it's local, it's national, uh, everything. So wherever you can get involved, wherever you feel like doing, you're going to be helping a seabird. So Absolutely. There you go. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We've got five minutes left before the Monterey Bay Aquarium officially closes, and we'll probably want to go home. Yeah. Uh, at some point. We love you guys. Uh, we absolutely love the chat. Thank you so much for being there. Um, uh, but we might have to close down. We might have we might get kicked out. Yeah. Here. yeah. It's also getting very dark in this room. It is. Yeah. So um, unless we can have a second daytime, we're, we're going to have to wrap this up <laughs> in just a little bit. But let's answer. Uh, let's see. Let's answer a few final questions. Have stellar sea lions ever been seen near the aquarium? Yes. I've seen stellar sea lions on the Red Buoy and also along Monterey Bay. A little bit south for them, but you do see them every once in a while. Let's see. You you take a question. Emma. Oh, let's see it. here. We've just had very kind comments across the board uh, from people over there on Facebook. We appreciate you, Trisha and and Donna, for uh, for uh, sending those si those kind comments in there. Yeah, everybody's in. Yeah. Oh, this is so great. Thanks. To Are the whales there. heading north? There we go. Oh. Over there on YouTube, Cindy asked that question a little while ago. Um, so the whales that are in the bay right now uh, are the humpback whales that we're seeing mostly. We also are seeing those blue whales and the fin whales. Uh, the blue whales and the fin whales are heading south. The humpback whales that are here right now are probably going to stay here over you the winter time. Uh, so right now, if they were here during the summertime, those humpback whales, and they're on their migration, they would be heading down towards Costa Rica. Uh, so they're all heading south right now. And then in the springtime is when we'll see them on their northbound migrations. We are kind of the stop, though, for those humpback whales uh, that are right now heading towards Costa Rica to go uh, mate and have uh, their calves down there. Uh, this is their stop. This is where they come to feed. So during the summertime, they're hanging out here in Monterey Bay. And that's really, you know, something that is just so fascinating to think about is if, if you're taking a vacation from uh, from California, say, uh, Oregon, Washington, and you decide to go down to Mexico to Baja in the middle of the desert to see gray whales. It's the same whales the that same were whales. just going by. You know, they say hello, and they just they go down to to their lagoons of Baja. Um, similarly, blue whales. If you see them off of uh, South America, they're going to probably be familiar with Monterey Bay as well. Humpback whales, the same thing. Uh, humpback whales in Hawaii go to Alaska and back. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're seeing maybe these same individuals, these same animals. We know that with white sharks, we're seeing the same white sharks in Hawaii and over here in California. They're that, they're that same species. So these animals that we see in one spot, just think about them as just always being on the move. And if you follow them, you might see uh, the exact same one. You know, it's exactly. uh, pretty, pretty yeah. cool. You follow a whale all around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be fun. Be a whale of a journey and a whale of a good time. Yes. And a whaley awesome day. Uh, okay, <laughs> we're done. Let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, keep up the great work. Join your Periscope. Oh, thanks for tuning in, John. What a way to wrap up the week. We agree. We're wrapping Thank it you. up there with the kelp. I said hi, hello, good to see you, <laughs> Fortnite. We can't say your uh, we can't say your second your second part there uh on this live stream but hey thanks for tuning in on yeah, youtube gabrielle over there on youtube next time can we tell them about the market squid absolutely we can do a squid stream soon we can do a squid yeah. stream yeah it'd be a slip stream no did that no, work that wasn't a good joke you're just squidding i was just squidding <laughs> yeah. incredible uh tentacular so with that everyone yeah. is 458 uh emily do you have any parting words for the fine folks out there uh on the chat oh i just wanted to say thank you again uh, especially for those of you who stuck with us this entire time that we were live here we're gonna try and do this more often so 
Uh, if we didn't get to your question this time, we will definitely try and answer more questions next time on our next mm -hmm. stream. And if, if you have any requests for topics, mm -hmm. special guests, anyone who you want to talk to, we can uh, try to convince them to come over. We'll bring snacks and other things. Uh, but if you have any requests, let us know so we can make sure to address those things uh, for you. All right. Okay. Well, with that, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in here to the Monterey Bay Aquarium live all across the internet. Uh, my name's been Patrick. And my name has been Emily and will continue to we'll be We'll continue Emily. to be, yeah. yeah. I, I, th this has been us, the social media team here at the Aquarium. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope to see you again soon at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Have a fantastic weekend, everyone. Nailed it. Okay, high fives up here. Waves to the camera. And we are going to transition us away from the cam. And we're going to fade out our microphone. And we're going to stop being live in about 10 seconds. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.